In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. If you were here Friday, this first part of it will be a bit of a review, but then we're going to move on. So uh, what we have here are the parables that denounce religion. The parables that are coming up next are parables that denounce religion. And we're moving into the second full day in the temple. And we recall how our Lord would go to the temple and then during the day, and then at night He would go back to Bethany to be with Lazarus, which would be on top of the Mount of Olives, a kind of like a Beverly Hills type situation. Lazarus was rich and uh, our Lord stayed with him to separate himself from the religious crowds in Jerusalem also because the religious crowd was always seeking to kill our Lord. But by going to the temple, our Lord Jesus Christ is making a full frontal assault on the religious leaders. And he's not going to turn the other cheek. In fact, we've already studied how he threw the money changers out and threw a lot of the religious leaders out physically remove them. So he doesn't turn the other cheek. He wasn't meek. He wasn't mild. He was tough. So tough that some of us might look at him and say, that man's nuts. And by the way, he's just rampaging through a temple. But what we see from 2133 is that religious people are the true people who are rude. The religious people had always said, well, this man, he's arrogant and crazy and he's just uh, uh, forcing his will on everyone. Well, he was cleansing his house. It was his house. And they had turned his house into a den of robbers. So when our Lord gets up to speak, well, religious people are rude. They're vicious. And religious goes along with legalistic. They may be believers, but they may be legalistic. And they are vicious and rude. And they always want to set someone up. Anytime you get a religious or legalistic person in a congregation, they always have a question. And it starts out as something being sincere, but uh, if you have any sense, you know better. It's not sincere. It's a way they want to trap you. And the only way to deal with them is to be as tough as our Lord has been. That is, if you have the gift of communication. If not, ignore them. But if you do, well, that's what your job is if they walk into the congregation. So some of the worst things that have ever happened in human history have evolved from religion. The most uh, current, 9-11, that came straight from the evil of religion. And religion and legalism are definitely not relaxing to be around. You cannot relax when you're around legalists who are always in competition with each other. And if you're a relaxed type person who is grace-oriented, you definitely don't want to be around a legalist who will constantly be judging you because uh, of your grace attitude. So in 21:23, now after Jesus entered the temple courts, the chief priest and elders of the people came up and interrupted him. They interrupted him as he was teaching. He was teaching a crowd of people. And all of a sudden, some people just uh, walk by and they actually keep on interrupting him. They don't just do it once. They keep on doing it. And they would say, By what authority are you doing these things? They would ask one time. And then our Lord would keep teaching and then they would say, By what authority are you doing these things? And keep interrupting Him. Until finally He was brought to a point where He had to answer them. Otherwise, the meeting would have had no account because of all the distraction. And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered, I will ask you one question. This is part of a debater's technique. Uh, someone asks you a question, so you answer the question with a question. It's a debater's technique, and it's very effective, and it works very well for our Lord right here. Jesus answered, I will ask you one question. If you answer me, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. 
Our Lord immediately recognizes these people from the crowd as being people who do not seek information. They could care less about the information that our Lord had to give. They're simply seeking to discredit our Lord, and He knows it. But uh, they've, they've come to Him with a, a, a suit of sweetness covering them. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And they look sweet, and everybody would say, well, they have nice personalities, but it is just a front. And it's a front because they want to discredit the Lord because He's been taking away uh, their congregation from the synagogue, and they don't like Him. They're jealous of Him, very envious of Him. And so uh, instead of uh, just uh, relaxing, what they do as legalists is attack the Lord and try to steal His sheep. So He uses a debater's technique, 2125. This is where the debater's technique comes into full focus. Where did John's baptism come from? And remember, the religious leaders did not like John the baptizer. They despised John the baptizer. Now, John the baptizer never touched wine. He never touched food that would be offensive to those in the crowd. Never. He ate uh, honey and, and such as that. So he did not even... Uh, he, he would live what you would think would be a life that they would praise. But they didn't like John the Baptizer because when he would preach, he would implicate them. And remember John the Baptizer's message to them? You brood of vipers! That's what he called them. And he was talking about the religious leaders. He would call them a nest of rattlesnakes. And um, so they didn't like to be called a brood of vipers or a nest of rattlesnakes. They despised that. Therefore, they despised John the baptizer. But the people thought he was a prophet, and he was. He was more than a prophet. So they thought that they, that uh, well, they're worried about what the people think. Because our Lord asked them, is he from heaven or from men? And they had to discuss this with one another, and they said this, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? That's pretty logical. These Pharisees, they're not stupid people. They're smart. Many of them are geniuses. And they can memorize Scripture after Scripture. And they have high intellect. So they, they get caught in this question. And so they have to reason amongst themselves. And they say, well, if we say that He's from heaven, like the people know He was, and like the people would like us to say, then we're trapped. Because he'll say, why didn't we believe him? And by believing John the baptizer, they would have to believe that Jesus Christ was their Savior. So they're caught there because they don't want to believe in Jesus Christ. Then they continue. But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they consider John to be a prophet. Religion always fears the people. Religion is always oriented toward approbation lust. And uh, if the people in a... Uh, the reason why a lot of pastors who might even know better do not teach doctrine is because they fear the people. And there have been people who have come out of Baraka Church who have gotten the doctrine and who, and who have said, yes, that is right. And then they've gotten up in front of the congregation and they start to preach it just a little bit. And then, boom, here comes the attacks. And they get scared of the people. And so they revert back to what they were teaching to start with because they're worried about the numbers in the congregation. Number conscience and people conscience. And religion always is people conscience. They would rather have a big crowd than to uh, have a wonderful spiritual life. And they would rather have a big crowd than to do their job as unto the Lord. It's disgusting. Who cares how many people show up? And they're worried about their own financial situation, etc. But uh, if the pastor doesn't know that the cattle on a thousand hills are his... How's his congregation going to know that? And they won't. And there'll be a bunch of losers along with the pastor. And all of that will be brought out at the Bay Mob. And so he said, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? And if we say from men, we fear the people. <clears throat> so the criteria for the religious crowd, the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, the criteria was not truth. They didn't say to themselves, what is truth? They could care less about truth, but they said to themselves, what do the people think? And the majority is not always right. In fact, the majority oftentimes is wrong. The majority in this country many times has been wrong. Majority rule is a, it's a weak rule, almost a type of mob rule. And uh, when you have a bunch of idiots voting, you get a bunch of idiots in office, and then you wonder why things are falling apart. 
Well, the main reason is people don't love the Word of God, but secondarily, if you were to look at the politics of it, you would say it's a bunch of idiots voting in idiots. We're a representative government. If, uh, if our government is filled with stupidity, then who do we blame but ourselves? And so, what we have here is the fact that uh, the majority is not always right. And what, what they would have been a, a lot better off if they would have uh, simply went with the truth. In fact, they would be in heaven if they would have went with the truth. But instead, they went with what the majority of the people always thought. 2127. So they're in a pickle now. They don't know what to do. They're in a tight spot. So they answered Jesus, We are not able to say. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He got them, and they knew it. And they were humiliated in front of all of the people who used to listen to them. They were the synagogue leaders, and uh, they were furious. They were infuriated by this point. The Lord, they were trying to catch the Lord. They were trying to entrap Him, and He just uh, spins it right around on them. Uh, they threw out the boomerang, and it came back and bopped them on the head. And boom, they were caught before they could even think. And now what's funny is our Lord goes into parables. The par- we go now to the parable of the two sons. Now, a parable is a story, of course, that is linked with doctrine. If you don't understand doctrine, you don't understand the true meaning of the parable, but you can understand the storyline. The storyline is simple, and you can follow the storyline and come to a very easy conclusion. And the funny thing is, is that these religious people are going to hear this parable, and at first they're all going to agree with it, and they're going to shake their heads, yes, amen, Jesus, yes, hallelujah, Jesus. And then afterwards, uh, suddenly, he's going to send in the right hook, and they're going to say, he was talking about me. And it's really going to tear him apart. So in 2128, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. Then in 2129, the boy answered, I will not. But later he regretted and this regretted is actually metamelami. It's actually an emotional regret. He felt sorry. He felt guilty for telling his father he wouldn't do it. And he did regret it. He did feel guilty. Metamelami. He didn't. He changed his mind. But along with changing his mind, he felt guilty about it because he told his father, "I will not." And he did that out of emotion, by the way. Anyway, he was busy thinking about something else, and he got irritated by his father saying, do this. So he said, I'm not doing it. I will not. And then later he regretted it and had a guilt reaction, all of which is emotion. But later he regretted what he said and went. Now the father represents the Lord. And the Lord said, do this. And he said, I will not. And guess what? The Lord never said nothing else after that. He didn't keep prodding. He didn't keep saying, yes, you will, or I'll beat the living tar out of you. No, he just left it alone. But this is a representative. This is representative of how our Lord views volition. And when uh, it, when he comes up against your volition and your volition says no, he says, all right, he's a gentleman. Now, in terms of what you do with your own children, they say no, and you must get them to say yes by whatever means. But uh, this is an analogy. And then in 2130, the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And this boy answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. And this refers to lip service. There's a lot of people who give lip service to the Lord, but they will uh, never fulfill God's plan for their life. They're nod to godders. That's what I like to call them. They go to uh, su- they go to church on Sunday, as many Southerners did today, and they went to church and they nodded to God and they recognized His existence and they all shouted Amen, Hallelujah, and uh, all felt good about themselves and went home and they gave a lot of lip service. But Monday through Saturday, uh, probably even on Sunday, they're out of fellowship. They don't even know how to rebound. They don't know anything about Scripture. And they are just as ignorant the next Sunday as they were the first, if not more ignorant and more involved in legalism. And so these, these legalists, these, uh, well, this is perfectly analogous to the way churches function today. They say, I am serving you, Lord, and they're not even close to serving the Lord. They don't even know what the spiritual life is. 
They don't know how to rebound. They don't know how to be filled with God and the Holy Spirit. And that's the most important. If you're not filled with God and the Holy Spirit, you're not living your spiritual life. That's the power. That's the gasoline. And then if you're not living your spiritual life, if you're not filled with God and the Holy Spirit, you'll never be able to live the faith rest life or anything else. You're dead in the water. You're a carnal believer. You are lukewarm. And Jesus Christ will vomit you out of your mouth as He has been vomiting out of the mouth, out of His mouth. He will vomit you out of His mouth as He's been vomiting many people out of His mouth as of late. Now, my in-laws fared pretty well through that hurricane. They stayed there for it. Uh, if you weren't here, they're about 50, 60 miles north, northeast of Houston in a place called Shepherd, Texas. And uh, they were on the weak side of the hurricane and they didn't get much sleep during the night, but their house is standing and the power's out. I don't know if it's back on yet or not, but uh, they fared very well and Houston fared very well. And TNP fared very well, which is a co consolation to me. I can still order my tapes. And so uh, it went more toward Louisiana. There must be something wrong with them people, but that's where it went and attack them, the heathen. So in uh, 21, in, uh, in uh, 21, uh, 31, he, uh, Jesus Christ asked them the question now, which of the two did his father's will? And uh, these that uh, remember the religious crowd is there listening and they're going to be the first to want to come up with an answer to look smart. They're so full of themselves. They're full of self-righteousness. You've got to know they're going to be the first to pipe up. And so they all shout out, The first! The first! And then Jesus said to them, Now how do I know it was the religious people? Because Jesus is about to insult them. They just gave the correct answer. And they were all eager with a smile on their face. The first! The first! And now our Lord is just going to... Well, after they gave such a beautiful answer, you can imagine the rage they're going to feel after he says this, looking into their eyeballs. I tell you the truth. Tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before you do. Well, that shut them up in a hurry. They went from smiles to frowns. And they are their blood is boiling by now. And they are thinking mental attitude murder in their stream of consciousness. They're ready to murder the Lord. And the reason why the tax collectors and prostitutes are the ones who uh, move into the kingdom of heaven first or the kingdom of God, those, are, those two are synonymous. If you've wondered what the difference is, they're synonymous. The kingdom of heaven is for those who are uh, on the earth. When you go to the kingdom of God, it's believers in the kingdom of God. But it's synonymous. So the tax collectors and prostitutes, they have no illusion about life, none whatsoever, because they have uh, come in contact with all types of people. The prostitutes had even probably uh, slept with some of that religious crowd who acted all holy, but they kept it on the, the down low and they just wanted the business so they didn't uh, say anything about it, but they knew that these people were sinners like everyone else. And they knew that they were being phony just as they were being phony in their sex acts. And they are. The prostitutes are phony. And uh, if we ever study Jeremiah, you will be tremendously shocked by what uh, comes out of the Hebrew in Jeremiah when it comes to the ladies. Uh, never mind. But uh, one day we'll get to it when the uh, younger people get older. So, what happens now is... Uh, which which of the two did the father's will? They said in the first, and then they got this slapped across the face with the glove. And the tax collectors and the prostitutes have no illusion about people because they've been around people, and they know that the, uh, everyone else is a sinner, and they know they're sinners themselves. So they come to grips with the fa they're not self righteous. When you're self righteous, you're full of yourself, and you think you're so good. God is impressed by what who and what you are and what you do in life. And so you're going to heaven because God is impressed by you. And that's what all the religious people thought. They thought they were going to go to Abraham's bosom because they were born in the line of Abraham and because they had been so good following the Mosaic Law. But that's not the way of salvation. The way of salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. And when the prostitutes see this and the tax collectors, which they were ostracized from society, they immediately grabbed onto it and believed. So, uh, by way of uh, application, when we get to heaven, we're going to rub shoulders with a lot of prostitutes. 
But if you go to hell, you're going to rub shoulders with a lot of self-righteous nitwits. And uh, you might even rub shoulders if you go to hell with some of your own church members who are so self-righteous. And that's what makes hell even worse. Gnashing and all that, gnashing of teeth and screaming out. Uh, on top of that, and the only people there, or most of the people who are going to be there, are going to be self-righteous people. What a terrible place. And that is what ha that's exactly what's going to occur. And many people are going to be shocked with the way all this is going to turn out. And many people who thought they were going to heaven are going to be shocked at the last judgment. And it's uh, and they don't need to be. Our Lord has given them every chance. So then in 21.32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe. Although you saw this, you did not have any regret. He's going back to the parable. Remember, the first guy said, no, I will not. That's what the prostitutes and the tax collectors did at first. They said, no, I will not. And then the Lord comes along and says, believe in me and you will have eternal life. And they said, okay, yes, I will. And so they had a change of mind. And the indication from Metamelomai is they had a change of mind along with the guilt reaction but for a prostitute, that might be understandable. Or for a, a tax collector who has been ostracized by society. But we almost always must remember that guilt is not part of salvation. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Whether you feel guilty about your past or not is inconsequential. But the indication is that the tax collectors and prostitutes did. But they still believed anyway. And when you believe in Christ and you know that's the way of salvation, it doesn't matter how you feel about it, guilty or not. So although you saw this, you did not have any regret, metamelomai, emotional regret, about your decision not to believe in Him. And the reason why our Lord uses metamelomai with these religious people is because that's their frame of reference. That's the way they work with people on, the, on guilt. And then they say, if you feel guilty about this, well, then you're, you're a wonderful person because you have uh, realized the error of your way, and God is impressed with your guilt. So he's working with them on their frame of reference by using metamelomai. That's all. So then in 21.33, the parable of the tenants. He's going to send another parable. He just lambasted them with one parable in which they first heard it and they thought, oh, this is all right. He's being very soft and kind with beautiful flowery stories. And then at the end, bam, mm -hmm. sideswipe him. Now he's coming in at it with another parable. Now he's using parables at first. That's as if he has his gloves on. And then later, right before he goes to the cross, the gloves are coming off. And he is going to rip them to shreds constantly. He's not going to let up on them. And he doesn't do it because he's mad. Our Lord never got mad or angry. He's righteously indignant, of course, but he's not mad. He's doing it because he's trying to shock them into seeing that they are sinners. And these self-righteous people have a hard time seeing that they need a Savior. So he's going to do everything he can out of love, albeit a tough love. And it's a tough love, but he loves them so much he wants them to believe in him. So he gets tougher and tougher. 21.33, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and went on a journey. When the harvest time was near, he sent his servants, that is, the prophets. Now, the watchtower, now what we have here, there was a landowner, Jesus Christ, the landowner of Israel. He planted a vineyard. The vineyard represents Israel. He put a fence around it, representing protection. Dug a wine press in it, representing logistical grace support. And built a watchtower, meaning he was going to protect them from enemies. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and went on a journey. When the harvest time was near, he sent his servants, that would be prophets, to Israel, to the tenants to collect his portion of the crop. So Jesus, this is an analogous to Jesus Christ sending down the prophets to collect his portion of the crop which was in Israel. The crop had to do with those who believed in Christ in Israel and those who executed the spiritual life in Israel. 
So he sends the prophets down to, uh, well, give them doctrine. And if they were to get doctrine, then they, therefore the prophets collect the portion of it and uh, give it to the Lord. And that's the indication. 2135. But the tenants seized his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And most of the times when the great prophets would come down to Israel, they would either beat them, stone them, or kill them. Jeremiah was beaten. Jeremiah was thrown into a, a, a thing in which he would have been drowned by the quicksand. And some African came and pulled him out. And he, he was beaten oftentimes. And Elijah was chased all around the desert. And all the great prophets who came down were always attacked by the Israelites. And so this is our Lord's this is our Lord's analogy that he sent some servants some prophets and yet you beat them you killed them and you stoned another and remember he's talking to religious people who know all of these stories and they know that in the past in their lineage there were people who did this to the prophets they'd studied all of that so they're starting to gleam now he's talking about us he's talking to us as if he's not a Jew etc cetera, etc cetera. Then he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them the same way. And the other slaves, John the Baptizer, along with uh, a lot of others, a lot of the minor prophets, he sent all of them, and they treated them the same way. John the Baptizer, his head was chopped off. Then in 2137, finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But when the tenants, Israel, saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, they threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? And so he's telling this story to a bunch of religious people who have no doctrine. And so he asks he asks them. He's about to trap them again, but they're so stupid they don't know it. They were trapped the first time. Now the second time goes around. They forget about it, and they're listening intently to the story because our Lord uh, did it very eloquently, far better than I ever could. So he was doing it so eloquently, they were all listening. And their ears were wide open. And they were listening to our Lord talking about the vineyard and the owner, and they're really getting into it. So he asked them a question. And, and they said, what, what, will, what will he do to those tenants, the owner? What, would, what will God the Father do to these? And they said to him, He will put those evil men to a miserable death, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants. Other tenants, of course, is the church. And this was the doctrinal point he was making. And they, they didn't even know that our Lord was talking directly to them as the tenants, as the Israelites. But they give the correct answer simply because it's a parable. And the parable and the doctrine lines up with the parable. So if you understand the storyline, you can still give the correct answer and still not understand the doctrine. So he will put those evil men to a miserable death and he will rent the vineyard to the other tenants who will give him his portion at the harvest. So they said this, and now Jesus is going to hit them again. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the Scriptures? And they, there's, remember, religious leaders, they've always read the Scriptures every day. They're very devoted to it. And even in uh, Israel today, if you look in their schools, uh, they read from the Torah, and the little children have the hat on their head, and they read it and go, and read it as they go along, banging their head up and down. And they do it over and over and over again, and oftentimes memorize many portions of it. So Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures? That's an insult. You can't see it on the surface, but I guarantee you that is an insult to them. Of course they've read the Torah, the Scriptures. The rock the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The rock is Jesus Christ. The builders, Israel, they rejected Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has become the cornerstone which uh, holds up between Israel and the church. So he's telling them, your time's about over. 
This is from the Lord, and it is marvelous in His eyes, or in our eyes. And then in, in 2143, For this reason I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. They've been producing human good, legalism, religion. That's all they do. They don't have the filling of God and the Holy Spirit, and neither does anyone else at this point. But we're moving into a different phase in which people produce fruit by being filled with God the Holy Spirit, by living their unique spiritual life. And he's telling them, you've never produced fruit. You've always done it in human good, human works. You've always sought your own power instead of the divine power. Therefore, you don't produce fruit of or, or good of intrinsic value. You produce bad fruit. 2144, the one who stumbles over this stone, that's Jesus Christ. The one who stumbles over the stone, the Jews. Many of the Jews, some believe. But the Jews at this time, especially nearly 99.9% .9 of all the religious Jews and the religious leaders, stumble over the stone because they don't believe in Christ. And they will be broken to pieces. This is a reference to the rejection of Christ at the first advent. They completely and totally reject Him and will be broken to pieces. This cycle of discipline is getting very close and He's making it very clear that it's on the way. And the one on whom it falls will be ground to a powder. Now this is actually an inner corollary in which it go, you can uh, switch from the first advent to the second advent very easily. It's inner corollary. And you could go to the second advent and the people will be smashed to powder through the baptism of fire. And in, this, in these passages, our Lord refers both to the first and second advent, oftentimes completely skipping the church age because the church age is unrelated to Israel. And because we're unrelated to Israel... There is no prediction we can make concerning the resurrection. None. I, mean, I hope you understand that by now. There's no way. We're separated from Israel. The seven years of the tribulation are for Israel. Daniel's 70th week. They're not for the church. So why would we know when the resurrection is going to occur? We don't. And what sign would be for us? None. We're not Israelites. It makes sense to me. We're completely separated. And what we are to do is live every day as unto the Lord, whether the rapture occurs at 8 o'clock tonight or a million years from now. It's not for us to know, and it doesn't really matter. Because if we did know, if we knew that, well, the resurrection is going to occur within the next three years, we would probably have a lifestyle change or uh, travel somewhere we've never traveled before because we're about to go or... But maybe some people might even get the idea to sit in Bible class more often. I doubt it. But uh, somebody might get that idea because they're about to be evaluated, see? But if we knew that, we would change some part of our lifestyle, and we shouldn't. All of us are to live the unique spiritual life. And we don't know when the resurrection is going to occur. There are no signs of the times for us. It's been a whole hell of a lot worse in human history before this time. And we think times are pretty bad because... A uh, human perspective begins at the day of their birth. And you say it's never been this bad ever before. Well, your perspective is limited to when you were born. And if you learn a little bit about history, you know that, uh, well, even early in this country's history, the lifespan of an adult male was 40 years old. And diseases would run rampant and there was no uh, proper sanitation, and there was no uh, proper uh, type of where you would flush the commode. What do they call that? Not the, the plumbing, whatever. They didn't have those things. They didn't have sanitation the way we do and plumbing the way we do. And they would only live to be about uh, 40 years old and drop dead. And then in the Middle Ages, they would have plague after plague after plague, wipe them out. And Europe lost a third of their population within a 100 years. And the economy, instead of growing, shrunk. And they went into the Dark Ages. Uh, but at the same time, it, for example, during the Dark Ages in the uh, 600s, China was having a revival. And whether you, know, you might not know this, but uh, China had a preponderance of believers in the 600s. And there's been a lot of evidence of people going over there uh, witnessing, and they just exploded into Christianity. And China became the most prosperous country in the world at that time in the 600s, while Europe was falling all apart in decadence. 
And then the Chinese faded out and then it moved on and it went back to Europe and now it's in the United States and who knows where it'll go from here. But the fact is, uh, the times have been a lot worse. If anything, these are some of the best times ever, but they're coming to a close because people aren't taking an interest in the Word of God. And there was a time when a lot more people took an interest in the Word of God. And in the 80s, in the, in the 80s, seemed to be at especially late 70s into the 80s, a lot of people got on the Word of God. Uh, Colonel Arby Thiem had over one million tapers. And now, well, the last I heard before he faded away was uh, 100,000. So people just split from it once prosperity came back to the country. And as a result, we're prosperous now, but uh, if, if people don't wake up, it'll get worse, and things will. Uh, only to wake us up, though, and that's the only reason, not out of some type of hatred or, or anything from the Lord. He just wants us to wake up to the Word of God. And we do have a preponderance of believers in this country. You won't find a larger group of believers anywhere in the world. You go to Europe, it's all decadent. You go to Africa, there are, poor, there are some areas where uh, Christianity is taking root, but they don't have nearly as many as we do. You go to China, um, Christianity is in a minority, and they're always persecuted. Everywhere around the world, there's really not that much Christianity to be, that is even known. I mean, there's just not very many Christians. The Most of them are right here in the United States and right here in the South. And it's uh, and so we're prospered because of it. But if we go away from the word, as goes the believer, so goes the client nation to God. So he sends warnings after warning after warning to wake us up. Now he doesn't just automatically say, "All right, you haven't been following my will." Boom, fifth cycle. No, you're warned, and you receive warning. And then if that doesn't wake you up, you receive seven times worse than the first warning etc. We've studied the five cycles of discipline. And so our Lord is bracing them, telling them, look, you're about to be turned to powder. Imagine these religious people who have always thought they were the greatest ever and that they would be the greatest in Abraham's bosom and that they would be the greatest in eternity. And all of a sudden, this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, gets up, looks them in the eye and says, you're going to be turned to powder. Can you imagine their reaction? Well, I, they hate him. It'd be the same reaction any any of you would have. Well, maybe not you, but any of most religious people would have. They would just have a tremendous knee jerk reaction and say, "I'm going to kill that man." Man doesn't talk to me that way, and just uh, become very arrogant. So when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that he was speaking about them. A light went off in their head. Well, they're just geniuses. That, that's almost like, duh. Yeah, he's speaking about you, duh. But they're so self-righteous, they can't see it until finally they just go, oh man, he's talking about us. And guess what? When they finally came to that realization, then came the anger, the bitterness, the rage. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the people because they regarded him as a prophet. So they're cowards. They wanted to arrest the Lord, but they started thinking about what the people would think so they decided against it. They're just cowards. And Well, a lot of people who are religious are cowards. And they talk about how they trust the Lord, but if they were ever drafted, they would run to Canada like a bunch of cowards. And their religion is useless. Yet somebody with doctrine, if they're ever drafted, would say, Yes, Lord, I'm going to kill the enemy! And as many as I can! That comes out of nationalism. And we'll see that from the fact that we learn about the uh, taxation and how we should pay taxes. And it follows along the lines that we should also serve our country. So now we move on to the parable of the wedding banquet. The parable of the wedding banquet. And this is the third parable that is rejected. And actually, the Jews rejected Christ many times through the Old Testament, and that's why he talked about the prophets being slaughtered in the past. But we have to know something about Israel. They have a spiritual heritage, a tremendous spiritual heritage. They have the law. They have Moses. They had David. They had all the prophets that were giving them doctrine. And they had a phenomenal spiritual heritage. But in the end, that spiritual heritage 
did not save them at all. And uh, we can look at our own country with its spiritual heritage. We were, found, we were founded on Judeo-Christian values, and we were founded as a, every family had a Bible back when it first started. Every family had a Bible. Every family, but they didn't have television, so every family would sit around, most every family, and read the Bible to their children. And they would grow up with an, a, a great spiritual heritage of having the Bible, of having the Gospel, etc. And then, uh, well, we still have that spiritual heritage, but it doesn't matter. Once, uh, once religion seeps its way into the spiritual heritage, it's ruined. You see, it, Israel started with a spiritual heritage, and they had people like David and Moses, and they uh, became a great client nation, and they still had the heritage, but they allowed religion to take over it. And there was a time in our country when the, a lot more of grace was being taught. And then uh, suddenly uh, comes infiltration of insanity, such as invite Christ into your heart, such as dedicate yourself. All of this is an infiltration of religion, an infiltration of man by man's own efforts trying to gain the approbation of God. And that's not how you do it. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And, but because religion has infiltrated our spiritual heritage, very few people can even ever come to see past all the garbage. Now, God the Holy Spirit, if someone wants to believe, allows them to see past the garbage in which they can believe in Christ. Otherwise, it's just clouded. It's like a veil. And there was a veil over the, the Jews' eyes, and there's starting to be a veil over the eyes of the people of the United States of America. And I can't tell... I, some of you probably know the reaction that would occur, but if uh, I were invited as a guest speaker, never will be, but if I was ever invited as a guest speaker to a very large Baptist church and I looked them all in the eye and said, you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart and you're wrong because the Bible doesn't say it. And they would about to... They would want to kill me like they wanted to kill the Lord. They would, want to, they would throw me out of there. Even though it's not in the Bible. They don't care. That's how they were raised in religion. So the religion takes hold and says, oh, that's blasphemy. No, they're blasphemous. But they don't know the difference. They're blind. There's a veil over their faces. And it's sad, but it's true. And so our spiritual heritage is falling prey to religion just as the Jewish heritage. So Jesus spoke to them again in parables. A parable, we have parabole. And para means to be alongside with. It's a story alongside with doctrine. And everyone can understand the story, believer or unbeliever, but not everyone can understand the doctrine. Only those who have a little bit or have enough doctrine pertinent to what he's talking about. So Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, 22, 22, 2, The kingdom of heaven, and of course the kingdom of heaven is on earth, the kingdom of heaven today is on earth. We are the kingdom of heaven, and we're on earth. Some of it's in heaven, but at this point, all of it was on earth. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom is on the earth, is like a king, that is, God the Father, who gave a marriage. This marriage has to do with phase one of God's plan for His Son. Phase one of God's plan was for Jesus Christ to go to the cross and die as a substitute for all of us, and He did. And therefore, as a result of that, our God the Father gives him a marriage. He's going to offer a marriage for his son. And uh, Jesus Christ, of course, is the bride. So in 22, what? So in 22, verse 3, He sent His servants, that is, prophets. He sent His servants to summon those those are unsaved in Israel who had been invited to the marriage, but they would not come. He sent his servants, prophets, to, those, to summon those unsaved Israel who had been invited to the marriage, but they would not come. Now remember in the past I, I challenged all of you to find the word invite in the Bible for me. Well, it's not in yours, I don't think. Do you have invite? Huh? You have invite? Well, there it is. Invite. 
but it means the complete opposite. That's why nobody shoved it in my face. So I could say, yeah, that's true. God's the one doing the inviting, not us. So he sent his servants to summon those unsaved Israel who had been invited. God invited Israel. Israel didn't invite God. And so you see the fallacy of inviting Christ into your heart. It's as if you're inviting him to his own wedding. Hey, Lord, I invite you to your wedding. It's stupid. It's the other way around. And the Scripture makes it very clear. But they would not come. 22.4 Again, he sent other servants. This would be like John the baptizer, the disciples, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look! He's giving them a second chance. Look, the feast I have prepared for you is ready. My oxen are fattened, my oxen and fattened cattle, that is uh, going back to the Old Testament type of sacrifice of oxen and fatted cattle. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Jesus Christ dying as a substitute for everyone. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding. So you're being invited to believe. The Jews, in this case, were being invited to believe. 22 verse 5. But they were indifferent and went different ways. One to his farm. What do people do on a farm? Work. And they work very hard. One time I spent a summer on my uncle, on my uh, cousin's farm in upstate New York. You might think of New York as being all city, but no. This, is the, this part of the world is the most uh, country part you could ever... No place around here even comes close to looking even close to that. Rolling hills and cows as far as the eye can see. And you can smell it as far as you can drive. And you get used to it, but at first all you smell is cow dung and skunk. And that's all they have out there. And uh, after a while you get to kind of like it. It's a weird thing, but if you were ever there, I think you would like it. But anyway, uh, the, the, my dad's cousin wake us up. He's a type of workaholic anyway, maniac type guy, got to work, work, work. Then he'd wake us up at 5 a.m., go out and work on his farm and bale hay. And that hay gets very heavy after a couple hours. And it was one of those rare times when it got up to 100 degrees and was humid. And it happens ra rarely, but when it does happen, it's oppressive. And man, I never had such a workout. And this man kept us up to 11 o'clock at night. Hard work. Well, that's what you do on a farm. Hard work. And thankfully, I was in a lot better shape and could handle it and been working out and all, so it wasn't too big a deal, but it was hard work. And so what, 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 what's being said here is here they are going. One went back, went back to his farm. Now, they were indifferent to the wedding and being invited to believe in Christ. Now, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm going to work for salvation. So they, w they went back to their farm. That's the road to legalism. The road of religion, working their way into heaven and working hard too. These are the Pharisees who go the road of religion. And they work hard. Don't think one minute they're not lazy or think that they're lazy. These people are getting up real early in the morning reading their Bible, reading their Torah, and then they go all day uh, giving to the poor. And what they would do is sound a trumpet. A Pharisee would walk down the street and sound a trumpet, and then all the poor people would gather around and they would hand out money and do good deeds all the time. None of us could match their good deeds today. But good deeds don't get you into heaven, so it's all a big waste. It doesn't equal plus R. So the ones who went to the farm, the road of religion, the road of legalism. Another to his business. This is the road of rationalism in politics. Business owners. Business owners use their minds a bit more than physical labor. Business owners think about things. So, this business owner is like a, a person in rationalism or in politics. This would be the Sadducees. They're the more rational types. They're still Jews, but they're the rational Jews. And in fact, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They're not legalistic by any means, but they, uh, they're very political. And they want the Romans out of their country. And they might use the Pharisees to gain a political end, as some people uh, might 
or as, as some as one political party might use Christians to advance their political agenda, which was wrong. They'll destroy themselves if they do. But if uh, but this is the way they function in rationalism and in their politics. This is the Sadducees. Then in 22.6 it says the rest. The rest of them are the Herodians. These are the three political parties, really. We have, first of all, the... Uh, well, we'll get into this in the next hour. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.